That's not what that's not what's supposed to be on the workbench. Oh, too many crickets. No, 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 no. We're not gonna we're not showing the Rocketeer and the 501As right now. We're doing an unboxing to show the two machines that Tony just sent from Ohio. Tony, remember, do you, you guys remember Tony? Tony's the one that sent the 192K, the Spartan. It didn't have any motor strength. And I went through the entire machine and it's just blasting his sewing to a new level now out in Ohio. Tony's a, an educator and also an avid sewer. So these are the wrong machines. These are, oh, Jiminy Crickets. Okay. 501A's. You guys gotta, you gotta wait your turn. You can't just jump. You just can't jump on the workbench and expect. Oh, come on, guys. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You gotta wait your turn. Oh, gosh. You guys, you guys just wait over here. You're gonna, you're gonna be on the workbench. You're gonna be on the workbench real soon. I promise you. I promise. I promise. I promise. Okay, let's get Tony's. Let's get Tony's containers up there. Oh. And Tony's container had all of the strapping that you've seen in my packing videos. He's an expert. He's watched all the packing videos and this was absolutely picture perfect on the outside. And Tony again um, comes from a city by the name of Delphos, Ohio. D-E-L-P-H-O-S. And uh, again, he number of weeks ago, maybe months ago, time passes so quick, he sent a 192K, uh, a Spartan, to the workshop. And his main concern after watching the videos on my YouTube channel was, mine doesn't have anything close to the power that Scott's 192Ks demonstrate. I want that power. Well, guess what? He's got that power now. And that's what he said when he reached out about these other two machines that he wanted to send is I'm loving my Spartan now and I want you to do the same thing to these other two machines that I just acquired which I'm not going to tell you what those machines are yet you gotta wait <laughs> so again the strapping was already on here I took the strapping off to give me a little bit of an edge so we're gonna go into this first container and see what Tony sent us. Move this to the side. Move that to the side. And again, those those 500 series singers, boy oh boy, they're getting kind of pushy, aren't they? They're getting kind of pushy trying to cut to the front of the line. You got to wait your turn. <laughs> okay. So again, Tony has uh, really embraced um, my packing style and has uh, both with, uh, well, with the last machine uh, that he sent, the 192K Spartan was just packed uh, perfectly. I mean, just beautiful job. And I'm expecting no nothing less on these two uh, machines as well. So let's see what we have. And I'm going to have to come up with a way to manage all of these peanuts that uh, Tony has sent my way. So let's put on a little bit more, put on a little bit more jazz, okay? Screen pointing the wrong way here. Okay, so we got a power cord. And this was surrounded up by peanuts. I don't think it's a big deal. I would still bubble wrap it, stretch wrap it, bubble wrap it, and probably put it in the harp of the machine area between the needle and the pillar. 
along with the foot controller is kind of what I would do. But again, Tony has uh, Tony's got this packing thing down to a science. He could teach a class on it. And being an educator out in Ohio, uh, I think he could do an excellent job of probably teaching a class or reteaching a class on my packing method or anything else he wanted to teach. I've had the privilege to uh, have a number of customers that are educators. And uh, gosh, there's so much there's so much of a pleasure to work with because they really they they really look at things uh, from a lot of angles and they get it. And that's not to say non-educators don't get it too, but I've really been impressed with the educators I've had contact with. Okay, let me see if I can lift this out of here, and then we'll uh, we won't have to deal with any more of these peanuts right now. We'll see. Oh yeah. Well, whatever this is, it's it's got a little bit of a little bit of weight. Yeah, that's got a little bit of weight to it right there. I'm just gonna look in the bottom of this tote just to make sure I don't have any other goodies that are hidden. Okay, and again, this is one of two machines that Tony just sent uh, to the workshop. So. This is actually a double, double unboxing that we're going to be doing in this premiere. Let's see. Did I already play this? Ooh, I'm seeing a dance floor. Anyone else seeing a dance floor? Was that it? Was it like a, a two second song? Seriously? Well, not two seconds, eight seconds. Ha <laughs> ha! All right, let's see what we get next. I hope this is an eight second song too. See what I mean by Tony has the packing method down to a science? This is exactly what you want to see, folks. The machine is protected on every side. I can't quite tell how much padding he has on the bottom of it. Again, when you, when you cocoon a machine like this, obviously protect the top, the sides, front, uh, and the rear of the machine, but don't neglect the bottom, especially if you've got a machine that's going to have those cast feet on the bottom. Uh, because even if you're putting peanuts underneath them, that takes a hard enough uh, whack uh, in transit. Uh, those legs could go all the way through the peanuts and could hit the bottom of that container and you could have a broken cast foot, which I can repair that, but why do it, right? Let's just pack it uh, like that. And I'm sure Tony did an excellent job. So let's see, let's see if we can get through the rest of the layers of this. I got enough layers yet, but I'm still angling those scissors kind of away from the machine just because we don't want to make any assumptions. Well, I'm getting a little glimpse of this already.
All right, I'm gonna zoom in on this. See, I'll give you a little preview, see if you can start tossing your guess out there as to what it might be. Got it angled the wrong way, doggone it. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a tough guess to make. Type it in the chat if you think you have a, a decent guess as to what machine number one that Tony just sent uh, from Ohio. And we're gonna keep working on this uh, to take off these layers so we can reveal what machine number one is gonna be. Oh yeah, we're getting down, we're getting down close to this real quick here. Yeah, I like taking breaks. Woo! Holy mackerel, I almost took out my vintage car. What the heck? Well, can you see it now? What do you think? Anything, anything at all, any guesses? What are you typing in the chat? What are you typing in the chat? Come on, come on, type away, type away. Even if you're from one of our international countries, one of our, one of our friends out of the US, I'll translate your post so everybody else can read it. So don't worry about that, just type it in, type it in. So what do you think, what do we have? What do we have? We're almost down the bare bones here, folks. Almost down the bare bones. I think my computer just rebooted. <laughs> Not sure what my computer's doing. It's I've got a blue screen. Blue screens I've I've been told are bad. Hopefully this is a, a not bad blue screen. We'll see soon enough. Well, for right now, we'll be without music. I'll just boot it back up and we'll see what happens. Well, if you haven't guessed it yet, then I'm kind of surprised. You got a pretty clear view of it right now, don't you? Make sure my angle is, yeah, my angle is good to go. And notice I, I kind of did a premonition here of where Tony would put that foot controller. Beautifully wrapped right in the harp space. That's a perfect place if you're shipping a machine uh, to put that foot controller. No matter what kind of machine it is, wrap that foot controller with stretch wrap, bubble wrap it to, to give it cushion and protection and then stick it right into that harp space area. It's a perfect little storage compartment.
Well, if you typed in the chat anything like the Rolls Royce of Singers, the Singer 201 2, then you are absolutely correct. Uh, the 201 2 is what machine number one that Tony sent is. Also, uh, as I coined it, the uh, Rolls Royce of Singer sewing machine. So I'm going to leave this to the side. And it looks like, this is interesting, I don't know if Tony did this or the person that he got the machine from, but it looks like they used lamp cord to uh, wire the foot controller. Which I'll have to check the amperage on that. Some lamp cords are okay. Uh, other lamp cords are not rated uh, to the level that when I wire a foot control or wire up a machine uh, that I would put on it. And that's no big deal. I'll take care of that. Um, as a general rule, you want to have wiring on your machine that will uh, cover you all the way up to 3 amps. And you might say, well, wait a second. The uh, Singer 201-2 has a 0.54 amp motor. It peaks like at 0.6. Why would you need 3 amps? Well, because it gives you a buffer and allows that amperage to flux up and down. Because as you're running the machine, the amperage is fluctuating. You're operating the uh, sewing lamp as well. And uh, there are variations as far as how your house is wired and how it supplies energy to appliances that you're plugging in, whether it's a KitchenAid blender or whether it's a 201-2 Singer sewing machine. So uh, I always uh, will wire machines so that they're covered up to at least uh, 3 amps. So what a beauty, huh? Tony, you've got good taste, man. Between the uh, 192K that you had previously sent, uh, the Spartan, and now I'm looking at this 201-2, and uh, I might have to make a trip out to Ohio. I, I, if you source this machine from somewhere in Ohio, which I believe you said you did, we got to go out together and see what kind of treasures we can find. Uh, especially if we're talking about um, if it were uh, an original owner machine. And I'm not sure about the providence on this machine. I don't know if Tony knows or not, uh, but I definitely would love to find out <laughs> because this is a beauty, isn't it? We're going to kind of turn it around a little bit. I'm, I'm still waiting to see what's going on with my computer to see if I can uh, get this puppy uh, fired back up so we can hopefully have some more uh, music. And you know what it's like. I mean, when you're when you're operating with your laptop or your uh, iPad or whatever it is, at the least opportune time, that device is going to decide that it wants to do some sort of an update, even if you've told it, no, I want to, I want to postpone this update. I want to delay this update. And it, you might even give it a window of like three hours. And then all of a sudden you go to try to do something and guess what that machine is doing? It's doing an update. What the heck? <laughs> Give me just a second here, folks. I'm going to see if I can get us at least heading the same direction again. And see if I can uh, get us fired up so we can have a little bit of music. Especially since we have another unboxing to do as well. Uh, for the second machine that Tony uh, just shipped here uh, to the workshop. So how are you folks doing? Um, I know we get uh, people from all over the world that will join on these premieres. Uh, we've had folks from Africa, from England, from Canada, from Australia, from Japan. Uh, and it goes on and on and on and on, which is absolutely incredible. I love our international viewers. Uh, and that really is how I met Hans Christian, who many of you are now familiar with. Hans Christian is uh, a gentleman that uh, I met by way of one of our premieres. And uh, as I got to know him better, recruited him to help me as far as being a moderator. And he's doing a fabulous job. Many of you have already had uh, contact with Hans. And he's been an incredible resource in helping research uh, questions for you or 
uh, details about machines. I know he just recently helped uh, Randy uh, with a machine that he wasn't able to get any information on and Hans was able to uh, dig that information up. All right, so we're back online, thank goodness. Unless it decides to do some sort of an update again. So, uh, so let me zoom in on the front of this 201-2 that uh, Tony just sent from Ohio. And uh, let's see what kind of opportunities we might find. I'm looking at decaling right now that looks absolutely fabulous. Uh, even the paint patina, uh, it needs a little bit of attention. You can see that oiliness across the top of there. See that? But that's minor compared to some machines. It looks like we're missing a, a spool pin. Uh, unless I discover it, maybe, maybe it'll be wrapped in there with a foot controller. I don't know. Um, looks like we need a bobbin winding tire. What machine uh, have I shown on this channel where you literally have a metal disc instead of uh, a rubber tire that's going to come in contact with that balance wheel to uh, allow you to wind a bobbin? You know, da 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 Dun, 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 dun. Well, if you didn't type the Singer Featherweight or the Singer 221 or the Singer 221-1 or the Singer 222 in the chat, then I guess you didn't know the answer. Because the Singer Featherweight is the only machine I've shown on this channel that has a basically a metal uh, sphere, a metal disc that's going to rotate into that balance wheel to wind the bobbin rather than having a traditional uh, tire rubber on there that's going to allow you to wind a bobbin. So there you go. If you didn't know that, which you may have known it, you may not have known it, I don't know. Um, and what kind of serial number do we have on this? If anyone wants to look this serial number up and post in the chat or following the premiere, post it on Facebook in conjunction with this premiere announcement, I'll send you something special. And the serial number, if you can't see it clearly, is A as in Apple, K as in Kevin, so AK5595, So if you want to look that up and post it, and we're also missing another part as well. Do you see it? Just to the right, we're also missing the bobbin winding tensioner that mounts to the front of the machine right there. So uh, Tony's got a couple of parts that are missing on the machine that we will have to uh, look at resolving because these are going to be important things. So uh, the tire winding uh, uh, tire, uh, and then we've got the uh, bobbin winding right there. And I think we had, did we have one other piece as well? I don't remember. But at uh, any rate, nothing, nothing super major. But at the same time, it's going to allow us to have a fully functioning Rolls-Royce of Singer sewing machines, which is pretty doggone important, right? So we'll get all that taken care of for Tony. And, uh, you know, as I get into the machine, I'll probably discover other needs that it has as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. The... Uh, the uh, spool pin for the top of the machine was also missing. So I'm going to start to turn it a little bit. We'll look at the uh, face plate and then we'll turn the machine around. I'm going to put this into the harp space just so we can turn the machine around more easily. So there's our face plate area. You can see that in the shot. I'm going to kind of zoom in on it a little bit. And I'm seeing a little bit of a weak response from the uh, presser foot lever. And when I say weak response, if I zoom in on this upper tension, watch those discs. Uh, you should see them move significantly. And what I'm seeing right now is just a modest movement. And that's, a, that's a, an issue of uh, probably cleanliness and also uh, 
I'll have to make sure that the uh, release pin that's in there is the correct one. I've gotten a number of 201-2s over the years where uh, folks will get an upper tension, maybe who knows where they get it on eBay or somewhere else, and it has the wrong release pin in there. So when you move that presser foot lever up, it's not making full uh, engagement to that uh, release pin, and so you're not getting full disc movement and releasing the thread. The problem with that is when you go to bring that presser foot up and you're trying to get that thread uh, pulled away so that you can cut it and then you can resume sewing, you're going to really be fighting and it's going to be, those discs are going to be pressing against it and you're going to be battling the, uh, the discs in getting that thread to advance so you can go on and resume your sewing. And you can see kind of the cleanliness factor there. See that oiliness uh, all over the brown, uh, kind of like the shrouded uh, uh, oiliness on here as well. So, and that's all well and good. We'll get it, we'll get it right and uh, get this machine happy and purring. All right, let's turn it around. Let's look at the back this 201-2 and my camera is kind of angled over here by the uh, potted motor and I'm not feeling any dents that's good and obviously this uh, part of the uh, deep cleaning and the service and the optimization I give to all machines that come into the workshop that are sent here is uh, to dig into that motor, get everything cleaned up, check wiring, rewire, recoat wires, uh, get all of those copper contacts, you know, super clean, uh, replace motor brushes, do all of the maintenance to that motor and foot controller as well to get it running just tip top. So, and I'm trying to turn that balance wheel right now, and I'm feeling a uh, Quite a bit of stiffness in there. We'll have to see see what that's about. And here again, you just can kind of see that oily coat on the paint. Well, look at how beautiful those decals are. Gorgeous decaling. And with a little bit of elbow grease and deep cleaning on that uh, paint patina, uh, we should be in real good shape. All right, let's look at the balance wheel side now. Turn the machine the rest of the way. And again, my big concern always is that uh, plastic housing where that power cord gets plugged in. Uh, I've had a number of machines over the years that have uh, arrived broken. Some of them were broken before they were shipped, but others broke uh, in transit just because that, all it is, is is plastic. That's plastic right there. And if it gets banged around enough, uh, it's going to uh, it's going to crack and fracture. But it looks like Tony's is in real good shape, and that's also a testimony to uh, how he uh, how he packed this machine. He did a, a super job, super job. Can you hear that? It's not supposed to make that sound, and that might may be simply. Um, oh, you couldn't even see what I was doing. It looks like our our clutch cover right here uh, is uh, scratched up pretty good. I should be able to get some of that cleaned up, hopefully for Tony. But what I was this is what I was trying to show you before. So we'll have to look at that. It looks like our okay, good, 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 good. I was gonna say it looks like we have an issue with our kickback spring as well, but it's just it's gummed up. But it is uh, it's not broken, so that's that's good. So all in all, in all I think that uh, we've got a great machine. I should say Tony has a great machine uh, that he sent to the workshop that once. We get done with this uh, Rolls-Royce of Singers. 
uh, Tony's probably going to set his 192K to the side and just have a lot of fun with this 201-2. Uh, or he's going to be going back and forth. You know, knowing Tony, the little bit that I do, he's probably going to set this up into his sewing room and he's going to be like on wheels sliding between one uh, workspace and another doing this project on the 201-2 sliding back over the by the 192K, uh, the Spartan. Again, and I've said this enough on the channel, if you're a faithful follower, for certain heavy-duty sewing, uh, Tony might be more inclined to use his Spartan, his 192K that I already optimized for him, because the Spartan has what size motor? That's right. If you typed it in the chat uh, and you said 0.8 amps, you're right. And the 201-2 again has 0.54 amps. It peaks at 0.6. So you've got, even when this 201-2 is peaking at 0.6, you still have two tenths of an amp uh, higher on that Spartan for heavy duty uh, engagement on certain materials. Now, when I get, get done going through the motor and the electrical and uh, optimizing this 201-2, you're going to be hard pressed to find uh, anything that this 201-2 can sew that that Spartan can't can sew better than it. They're going to both be just tearing it up. Uh, but at the same time, just general amperage, empirical amperage, uh, the Spartan has a slight edge. Uh, over the 201-2. So, but I think Tony's going to be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we don't even know what this third machine is yet. So he's probably going to have to set up a third workspace for this other mystery machine that we're going to be unboxing next. So, great, great find, Tony. This 201-2, at least on the surface. And again, I discover all kinds of things when I start to dig into a machine, as you know, just like I did with your Spartan. But this 201-2 on the surface... Wow, absolutely gorgeous. So let's move this uh, Rolls Royce of Singers to the side. I've got to find space for it because right now you can't see it, but this workshop is hippity hopping. So I'm going to do my best to move this to a safe location until I can get it up on the shelf uh, because I've got some other machines ahead of it. Actually, a number of machines ahead of it that I've got to take care of first. Okay, so we know about machine number one now. A uh, 201-2. And now let's see. We can put on a little bit more music, unless my computer reboots again. Then I'm going to have to hum. And uh, see what we have to put on here. This one is called Sugar Soul. Soul, like S-O-U-L. We'll see what this sounds like. All right. So, mystery box number two. Again, this had all of the strapping on the outside, like you've seen me, uh, you've seen me, uh, Demonstrate in my packing videos. Tony did it just perfectly uh, And I've already removed that just to give myself a little bit of an edge All right, so let's get that cover off and I'm, I'm expecting more packing peanuts, so I'm gonna get ready to capture those Oh, yeah, we got packing peanuts We got packing peanuts So if you're joining this uh, premiere a little bit late, this is the third machine that Tony has sent to the workshop. The first machine that Tony sent uh, 
was a Singer uh, 192K, the Spartan, uh, and uh, he is in love with that machine now after I went through that machine and optimized it. So here we just have a power cord again. Uh, it had a lot of peanuts around it, but I would recommend if you're shipping something like this, go ahead and stretch wrap it, bubble wrap it, and then put it into that tote. No idea what that is. I have no idea what that is. It looks like a vacuum attachment, doesn't it? All right, I think I got it far enough down that I should be able to pull it out of there, hopefully. is it's not light I'll tell you that right now and the rest is just peanuts in that tote so I think we're good to go I didn't even turn all the lights on. What the heck? <laughs> that helps a little bit, doesn't it? You're saying, boy, it looks darker. Yep, it was. And again, as you work around your, the machine unpacking it, point those uh, scissors away from the machine as you're cutting through, just to be extra cautious. doesn't have quite as much uh, protection around it but we still have it looks like four layers of bubble wrap which is adequate um, I would recommend you know probably closer to six layers but again Tony has uh, done a brilliant job of capturing the uh, packing philosophy that I've introduced to all of you so kudos Tony because I've had uh, I've had folks that uh, they're way off the mark they're way off the mark Well, any guesses yet? I mean, you can't see much of the machine. You can see a spool pin on top, and that's about the extent of it, so I'm not giving you much to work with. down to like one layer now if you have any guesses go and type it in the chat if you if you get it correct before I reveal the machine uh, I'll send you something special so kind of check to see what you can see at this point which isn't much I'm not giving you much to go on you can kind of see the body shape of it and such All right, here we go. So 
So we're all the way down to stretch wrap now. Any guesses? All right, here we go. Great packing job, Tony. Very good packing job. Very, very good packing job. We're down to the bare bones now. Any guesses, folks? Any guesses? I'm not looking at the chat, so I don't know if you've typed something already, but... All right, there you go. So if you typed in the chat, if you guessed, Singer 1591, then you are absolutely correct. And this looks like a Centennial model too. What year uh, was the Centennial year for Singer? Does anyone know? Anyone know what the uh, Centennial year for uh, the, the Singer is? Now let's see what this vacuum attachment is. Maybe it's a uh, Maybe it's some sort of a, a foot controller for this machine. I have no idea. So the two, uh, the two machines that Tony just shipped to the workshop, the first one we already saw, and now we're seeing the second one now, was the 201-2, and now we're seeing a Singer 1591. Those are probably two of my favorites favorite machines that Singer ever put out. Singer put out a lot of great machines though, didn't they? They put out a lot of great machines. Yeah, honest to goodness, I thought this this looked like a vacuum attachment when I first uh, took it out of the box. It looked like a vacuum attachment, without a doubt. But I think our second guess is going to be right. It's going to be uh, a controller. Maybe. Or it's going to be some sort of a jazzy attachment for the machine. I can tell you one thing, Tony, Tony did not skimp at all on stretch wrap. He did not skimp on stretch wrap. That is for sure. Well, this looks like a very, very... I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let you watch this. And then either uh, post in the chat or see if you can post it on Facebook in conjunction with this premiere announcement as to what you think this gadget is. I've already given you some hints. We'll put it right in front of there like that. I can tell you from what I'm seeing that this machine was mounted in a table. It was definitely mounted in a table, if that helps you at all. And I can see why Tony said now, Scott, I'm pretty sure I'm going to need wiring. So we, we, we came to the table with the understanding that I was going to probably have to rewire at least part of these machines. And I agree, Tony, completely. All right, let's move that back a little bit. Let's move this over there. Put on a little bit more music. I 
I will try to put on a little bit more music unless my computer went wonky donkey again. What did I say the last one was? Sugar Soul, right? Was that it? Or was it Lullaby? Lullaby Bye. I'm going to put on Hipsters Hopping now. Hipsters Hopping. Ooh, this is a jazzy one, huh? All right, let's zoom in on this mysterious thing in the front here. Sorry about that. What does it say? Well, you can read it as well as I can. It says, Singer Sewing Motor Controller. So this weird gadget, which I have never shown something like this on the channel before, that Tony sent with his 1591, is supposed to be the controller for this machine. I don't know if we're going to stick with this puppy or not, but it sure is cool, isn't it? And again, it looks like it was set up and mounted in a table, which is why it has all these extra extensions that could mount into the wood of that table and then it would be actuated. Um, a lot of them were set up as knee, knee control type machines uh, as well with attachments like this. So I asked you about the centennial year for Singer. And again, I, I didn't look at the chat real carefully, but did anyone get the centennial year for Singer? Because this is a centennial Singer 1591. I'm going to slowly zoom in on it and reveal what year that is. If you didn't guess already. Let me come down here so you can see it more easily. What year does it say? 1851 to 1951. So the correct answer, if anyone ever asks you, if you're ever on a program, and I don't, even, I don't even know if that program is still on the air or not, who wants to be a millionaire? And they go, all right, to win, win a million bucks, what is the centennial year for Singer, the Singer Sewing Machine Company? And you can go, ooh, 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 I know, 1951. So again, they, they started uh, their core production in 1851. And in 1951, they did a number of centennial uh, badge marks uh, like this for the various machines that they were offering at the time. You can find them on a lot of different sewing, uh, Singer sewing machines. And it does raise the value of the machine a little bit. Uh, a centennial machine is going to obviously be more rare than a general production type machine. So... Uh, Again, Tony has some really, really good taste in uh, picking out uh, some pretty awesome machines. The Singer 201-2 that you've already seen. And, uh, and I'm over by the computer trying to punch in some more music. Uh, and then uh, this uh, Centennial Singer 1591. Again, I'd, I'd love to make a trip out to Ohio. And... Uh, Go shopping with Tony, because he's got really, really good taste. Real good taste. All right, let's go around this machine a little bit. I'll throw on some more uh, music. And we'll see, uh, at least on the outside of the machine. And this machine does have that uh, tensioner for winding a bobbin. See it right there? Tony's 201-2 is missing it, but there's the tensioner on this machine, so yay! And you can see, we I'm, I'm going to have to look at mitigating some rust. You can see it on this uh, spool pin right here for winding a bobbin. And whenever you see rust on the surface like this, uh, it's going to right away throw up some red flags that there's going to be more rust on the machine, probably uh, on the undercarriage or in the rear of the machine, so I'm going to have to really check that carefully. And 
And we haven't taken a close look at the plug-in point, but that looks like it survived as well, which is great. And we'll check our kickback spring. No, we won't. We're going to go off camera. <laughs> Excellent. So our kickback spring is good to go on here. And yes, I can replace a kickback spring if it's broken, but just one less thing to do. And uh, Tony's 1591 actually has a bobbin winding tire. I haven't checked it for cracks in yet uh, to see if it's uh, serviceable. Otherwise, I'll replace that as well. And you can see we might have a little creature living in that space right there. So I'm going to put on my uh, big boy pants and get ready to fight any monsters that jump onto this machine. And here you can see again some of that uh, oil that's going to, you know, again, if you go to your local sewing center, they're not going to do a thing with it. It's going to look exactly like it does right now when you get it back. But I'm going to see if I can deal with some of the uh, oil on this paint surface as well, just to, you know, give it a general nice luster. And I can't see any numbers on the front of there. I don't know if they're totally masked in oil or if they're totally worn off. We'll have to see, see about that. But the decaling looks really good, doesn't it? Beautiful decaling on both of uh, Tony's machines so far. Uh-oh, where's the tension control? <gasps> Where is it? Aha, you guys are really smart. You're saying, Scott, it's a class 15 machine, dude. It's gonna be on the face plate. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh, I love messing with you guys, you're so smart. And we got quite a bit of pitting. You can see just a slight hint of rust in the pitting on there. Again, uh, there's going to be some rust mitigation on this machine uh, that has to be dealt with as well. There you can see it a little bit clearer on the edge, right where that opening is where you put your finger to pull it out. So wherever this machine was stored, uh, wasn't climate controlled, and uh, you got little, little hints of rust all over the place. All right, I'm gonna move this fancy foot control out of the way, and we'll turn this machine so we can take a look at the uh, faceplate. And of course, the upper tension control. Because all of you smarty pants already told me, Scott, it's not missing, don't call the police. It's right there. you see Tony sent it to the right spot he's like I'm not gonna clean this thing Scott's are gonna take Scott's gonna take care of all of that and I will kind of take a look the way it looks right now even on the faceplate and when you see this machine premiered it's gonna look a lot different a lot different even this presser foot uh, bar right there, needle bar, those are going to have to get cleaned up as well. And you might say, well, what, is it just so that they're pretty? Well, no. When that presser foot bar is going up and down and you're making it rise and fall, it's sliding through some real tight surfaces and uh, any of that uh, grime and dirt and stuff is inhibiting the free movement of it. Same thing with the uh, with the needle bar. We got to get all that stuff off of there so that there's nothing holding this Singer 1591 back. Nothing at all. The needle bar looks a lot better than the presser foot bar, doesn't it? Other than like right down there. Let's check our disc movement on here. We'll see how it's working right now. The 201 Niche 2 was not so was not so hot. Yeah, this one this one is responding, but it's it's not responding real well either. But when I get done with it, it's going to be better than a Swiss watch, that's for sure. So let me turn this around. We're going to look at the rear of the machine now. And our next song is going to be 
Lazy Boy Blues. Oh, we're really zoomed down on the the pillar there, huh? So it looks like our light survived the trip. Again, when you ship uh, a machine, it's never a bad idea to put uh, a thin layer of bubble wrap in between the body of the machine and the light because that light, if it gets pressed in or gets slammed from that side, you're going to have plastic hitting metal. So that bubble wrap could save a broken light uh, in shipment. And it's just a little, it takes just a couple seconds longer. And the outside coating on this uh, light uh, wiring looks awful, doesn't it? But that's, that's all grime. If I don't find any breaks, uh, in all likelihood that will not be replaced. There's our wire coming down off of the motor. Yeah, just a lot of cleanliness issues. Again, I'm not, I'm not feeling any dents. So it looks like that survived, uh, survived well as that survived well too that's what I meant to say sometimes my English is not so great I did well I just noticed this when I was closer to the machine I was going to zoom over here and show you as well and that's all part of the upper tension and you can see what is that that's not oil that's not veneer that's rust and you can even see it if you look real close the edge of that uh, presser, uh, the, the edge of that upper tension disc also is showing signs of rust on the outside as well. And actually that presser foot, yeah, that presser foot uh, lever is down right now and I'm able to move the discs with my fingers, which is also telling me that this upper tension is not, it's definitely not 100% correct right now. Because those discs, those discs should be clamped together right now where that presser foot is down. Uh, and I'm getting movement on them, so. So, as I said when I first started to look at the front of this machine, uh, this machine was stored in a place where it was exposed to the elements to some degree. And uh, there's going to be a lot of rust mitigation on this machine that... It's possible Tony Tony didn't talk about that, but he may have just thought Scott's going to notice it anyway. So you can kind of see it on the back of here too on the bobbin winding assembly. I'm going to zoom in on that to show you as well. So we have rust we have rust all over the place, folks. See it? heavy on the top and then it's kind of pitting, pitting into the metal going down. And again, rust, rust as a rule is going to work its way from the inside out, just like on a car. So what we're seeing on the surface is only the uh, tip of the iceberg. Alright, let's turn this over and we'll look at the last side of the machine on the balance wheel side. So again, just general cleanliness, and and this is the uh, one of the main junctions right here for the wiring for the machine. So if it's just dirty on the outside, uh, that's why I take the machine apart because I've got to get in between uh, in between the machine and the rear of that uh, wiring junction uh, area because any of the uh, uh, any of the copper contacts. Uh, are going to also have grease and oil and build up on those as well and that's going to hold the machine back it's going to affect how how efficient that machine uh, runs
And again, our balance wheel looks looks nice. It's even shiny. I don't know if Tony shined it or if it just came like that. But our, our clutch retainer right there on the outside that holds that clutch in place um, has some signs of rust, grime, veneer, just yucky-ducky. And I don't know if we're going to get a similar sound out of this one or not. If we kind of work that uh, balance wheel back and forth. If I can release that clutch, I think it's really stuck. Not bad. A little bit of a... Uh, it's, it's being held back a little bit. You can kind of hear that catching. But uh, better than the 201, that's for sure. So let me rotate this back so we're facing front where we started. And again, I think other than... The only, the only thing that's causing me a little bit of alarm right now is just the, the amount of rust on this machine. But it's something that um, I can definitely... Uh, mitigate it. It just adds more time to the project. But again, kudos to Tony. Absolute kudos to Tony on uh, his uh, his ability to pick some amazing machines. The 201-2 and then this Centennial Singer 1591. Absolutely gorgeous treasures that he scooped up out there in Ohio. I think he said he found them locally. And again, that's why I want to take a trip out there and go shopping with this man because he knows where to go and he's got a great eye. And if we go out there, I, I think I probably should drive a U-Haul out there, assuming that I find more treasures with Tony. But uh, some really cool finds, Tony. Uh, and I just have to say that I, I really am honored by uh, Tony... Uh, the first time he came to me was with that 192K, uh, that, that Spartan. And he was really frustrated with the power output of that machine after watching my videos and seeing what my Spartans could do. And because of the way I took care of him as a customer, because I, I honored his trust, because I took care of that machine like it was my own, and I got that machine running to its absolute peak, and he was so delighted by that, he then came back with these other two machines that he just shipped to the workshop. So now I've got a customer that's come to me three times with a 192K Spartan, with a 201-2 now, and now with a Centennial Singer 1591. I love customers like that. And I've had customers as well that have purchased a machine and then came back and bought a second bought a third. Uh, as a matter of fact, my one customer out in the Carolinas, uh, and I'm having an absolute brain meltdown right now, but I believe it's Sharon, right? Am I correct, Sharon? Sharon came and, and bought three machines for me, uh, and uh, I shipped them out to her out in the Carolinas. And that's that's the greatest way that I know that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm, that I'm walking the talk that I'm talking the talk and then I'm walking the talk is when I have customers that come back repeatedly, whether it's sending machines to the workshop to be optimized and to be restored and serviced, or whether it's uh, customers coming back and buying multiple machines. And uh, Maria is another very recent one that bought two machines from me. So I, I'm just incredibly blessed, incredibly thankful for all of you whether it's one machine or two machines or three machines. Uh, and knowing Tony, once he gets his 201-2 back and this Centennial 1591, you never know. I might have a fourth or a fifth machine coming from my friend out in Ohio, and I would gratefully uh, and humbly accept them and get those machines to their peak, uh, get them at the top of their game as well. So... Some amazing machines, Tony. Uh, this Centennial 1591, that uh, Singer Tool 1-2, and uh, I'm going to get busy. I am going to get busy and uh, get, try to get these machines uh, on the workbench as quickly as I can. Last week, to give you an idea of how busy it's been, last week I shipped five machines out of the workshop that were completed. Five machines. Now, it's just me, folks. 
I got a call from a lady the other day from California. She said, I can't believe I actually got you. I thought I would get like your assistant or a secretary. I said, it's just me. It's me. I'm the chief bottle washer. Uh, I restore the machines. I service the machines. I paint the machines. I do decals. I do clear coat. I optimize the machines. I repair the machines. I pack the machines. It's only me. So getting five machines shipped out in one week, that's phenomenal. I'm so, I'm so excited that I was able to do that. And I know the customers are excited as well when I sent them a notification, hey, your machine is on the way. It's like, woo -hoo! So uh, once I get through these other machines, Tony, I I'll hopefully reach out to you. And from Ohio, I'm going to hear a woo woo as you hear that that 201-2 and this 1591 have been brought to their, the peak of their game and they're heading east to join that incredible 192K Spartan that's already out there. Uh, and you're going to have a family of machines then that's going to be absolutely crazy and incredible. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right, well, thanks for watching. I'm hoping one of the next premieres that I post is going to be announcing what the giveaway machine is going to be for us hitting 7,000 subscribers. And I better get my my bottom in gear because we are soon going to be hitting 7,500 subscribers. And if I don't get that video up pretty quick, and uh, I'm going to try to pull Hans from Norway and Bill from Florida into the mix of judging this next contest, uh, we're going to be hitting 8,000 subscribers before I do my giveaway for 7,000 subscribers. So, but that's just how busy it is, folks. And I'm thankful for that. So I will get it up there. I will get that posted and I'll tell you what you got to do. I'll tell you what benchmarks you need to hit. And then I'm probably going to take a step back and let Hans from Norway and Bill from Florida judge the next contest and decide whether or not there's a winner. When we hit 6,000 subscribers, you might remember, had a couple of folks jump into that contest, but they didn't hit the mark. And there was no winner. So I'm really hoping, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that on next, this next contest that we're going to have a winner at 7,000. If not, then we don't. I'm going to leave that to Hans and Bill to judge. Uh, and then I'll do another machine giveaway uh, when we hit 8,000 subscribers, which is going to be coming real soon. I think right now with this coronavirus, on average for a while there, we were between... 100 to 150 new subscribers a month, which I think is, are you kidding? It's crazy. It's mind-blowing. But this past month, what is this, April? So in March, because it, it, what, what YouTube does is it gives me the last 28 days. The last 28 days on our YouTube channel we've had over 300 new subscribers click subscribe to join our channel. How crazy cool is that? But you know what? While it's crazy cool and I'm absolutely elated, the other stats that I look at as well is that in the last 28 days, we had over 250,000 page views. These are new people finding the YouTube channel, watching videos on the channel, but never clicking, never clicking subscribe. So while I'm absolutely delighted that we got a net gain of over 300 subscribers, new subscribers between March and April, the last 28 days, when we're having over 250,000 people coming to that to this channel in 28 days wouldn't it be awesome if even a a fraction of those folks said yeah this looks really cool this looks like a fun channel this guy's crazy he makes me laugh he makes me i never thought sewing could be this fun the guy dances too on the channel what he's not even a bad dancer he sings on the channel i'm gonna click subscribe can you imagine, would we then have a 1,000, 1,500 new subscribers 
in 28 days? I don't know, maybe more. So if you're one of those, if you're one of those 200,000 plus people that popped onto the channel and watched a bunch of videos and may even, may even have liked those videos and said, yeah, this is cool. Go back and subscribe, for goodness sakes, please. I beseech you, subscribe and join us. Because then whenever a new uh, premiere is announced, you're going to get the first notification of that. Whenever uh, a new opportunity to win something pops up on the channel, you're going to get a, you're going to get the first notification of that. Whenever my laptop starts showing, where is it? Start showing bubbles on the screensaver. You're going to get the first notification of that. When Tony sends another incredible treasure to the workshop, you're going to get the first notification of that. When I show that treasure, and there's a really cool, what the heck is that? And we're like, holy cow, that's a foot controller. What? You're going to be the first one to learn about that. So why wouldn't you want to be in that VIP status? All right, blah, 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 blah. All right, stay tuned for more great videos like this. If you're watching this and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. God bless you. Stay safe. And remember, we're all in the storm right now of this corona craze. But do not, do not let the storm get inside of you. All right? Stay calm. Be calm. Be at peace. God is still in control. Take care, folks.